Hello and welcome to the Quarantine Break podcast. I'm your host, Simon Ward, and this is the socially distanced tea break with extraordinary people. We're back. Series two, lockdown three, month 13 of 2020. I hope you've been doing okay. It has certainly been a while, but today's episode is filled with some much needed joy. And it's with Callum Scott Howells, one of the stars of Russell T. Davis' drama, It's a Sin. I answered the phone and my agent was like, are you sitting down, Callum? And I was like, no, but tell me anyway. And um, and, he, and he said, you know, you're not going to believe it, but, but this is the offer. And I just, oh, Simon, I just couldn't believe my luck. Prepare to become utterly obsessed with this man. As a friend of mine pointed out, he's having his Paul Mescal moment right now. Callum, of course, stars as Colin in the new Channel 4 drama, and he's just so brilliant in it. He's won the hearts of the nation, and if anything, the next hour is only going to increase all of those feelings. But enough of me, let's get straight into it. As always, I started by asking Callum how he takes his tea. Well, I take my tea um, quite strong, actually. Very little, very little milk. I, I I like I like getting all the the flavour in from the tea bags, especially when it's a nice Earl Grey. Do you know what I mean? I do love an Earl Grey because it, you have all those different lovely flavours in your mouth. So yes, a bit of, very very strong and with some agave nectar in it. Oh, talk me through that. That's an interesting choice. Well, agave is like a like a form of cactus, right? So it's like it's, uh, it's just, it, it makes me feel like I'm not putting sugar in my mouth. So it feels <laughs> like I'm not I'm not rotting my teeth because it's kind of it's, it's, it's a plant so it, although there's, there's a lot of sugar in it it kind of makes me feel like i'm getting a bit of my five a day as well <laughs> i like that you're sort of tricking your brain that you're not having sugar as well yeah exactly no but exactly that simon i'm i'm, I'm trying to be a good boy basically and <laughs> listen to my parents <laughs> So you've you've obviously done your first TV production now, which we'll come on to a little bit later. But when you're on this massive, massive TV production, (laughs) (laughs) but your time is so scheduled, you need to get people to do things for you, like get you cups of tea. Tell me honestly, what was the tea like on It's a Sin? Oh, you know what? So it, it was coffee on It's a Sin because we had to like, there's so many scenes that needed all the energy in the world that <laughs> coffee was my way through it. We, every day there was a Costa run, <laughs> which was amazing. And and um, Lizzie, one of our amazing uh, people who worked on the show, she would always come in and she'd be like, right, what are you having? What are you having today? And in the end, they they knew exactly what I wanted all the time. So it was it was always um it was always oat milk and oat milk latte for me. I mean, I've been on a lot of TV sets. I don't know why there's not a BAFTA for the people that go and fetch the tea. You know what, Simon? I tell you something now for free. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you are bang on. If they bring that in, I'm sure for It's a Sin, that'll be the first of many, many awards. But we will come on to It's a Sin very, very shortly. Callum, thanks for joining me today. We're so many months into lockdown and we're still talking on video chat. I think just before Christmas, I'd reached my absolute limit of this technology, but Christmas weirdly rekindled it for me. You've probably done a lot of these over the past few weeks. How are you finding this as a way to communicate? I'm actually used to it now. I think I've found a way to really enjoy it because you've got to laugh about it, especially yeah. when the connection goes down and everything starts crackling. You know what, Simon? You've got to laugh it off. I don't know. If we don't laugh, we'll cry, eh? So, you know, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to find enjoyment in it, I think. So, you know, I, I'm really used to it. I really, I really enjoy Zoom now. You know, the Zoom quizzes, I'm a bit over. Yeah. But hey, talking to people and just chatting like last night i met up with some amazing friends over zoom and friends that i haven't seen in years because i did amdram with them growing up and you know it's bringing us all together and we can't argue with that so hey let's find the light and the joy in it all (laughs) and let's celebrate it do you know what we need we need that kind of positivity because we're in lockdown three although i've been calling it two which makes me feel like i slept through the middle one but how are you (laughs) finding how are you finding everything well I, you know what? I've really adapted to this way of life now, Simon. It was, don't get me wrong, it was difficult to start with. Like those, that first lockdown was, was you know, it was a big adjustment, right? Because mm. life had been so crazy, especially like the sort of beginnings of 2020. It was, there was all these rumblings going on. Everything felt quite frantic. And it felt like a crazy year, even just for this to happen yeah. to you. So it was a, it was a huge adjustment. But you know what? Now I'm really starting to enjoy it because I have no pressure to do things 
for like I don't, I don't have any pressure to do anything really I don't have to I don't have to go out and do things I can just be in my house and do it which you know what Simon I'm loving because I can I can eat while I'm doing stuff <laughs> I can I can have I can have cups of tea and coffee whenever I want for free my dad <laughs> it's just so it's just in that way I love it and I've kind of I've kind of I'm starting to enjoy the structure I'm doing a lot of yoga which is my, which is one of my big things that it, that's become a big part of my life since my drama school training, and yeah, just just running as well, and, and of course my gorgeous dog Dewi. Oh, talk us through the dog. Well, he's a he's a lovely blonde cockapoo, um, who is just the most craziest dog in the world. But I tell you what, you know, at the end of the day, he is such a kutchaholic, which <laughs> which and and kutch is a Welsh word for hug, yeah, and like. It's, it's a word I use all too often, to be honest, because, you know, we all love a cutch. No one can cutch like my mother. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've, I've sort of, I, yeah, just my dog has just become my life, Simon. He's he's just a beautiful little little thing he is. Well, come on to TV that you've been watching a little bit later, but have you seen mm. Pooch Perfect? Is this the new Sheridan Smith show? Yeah. Me and my mother watched the first episode, and I got to say, we are huge fans, massive fans. We love it. It's amazing. And you know what? I'm actually so chuffed that groomers are starting to get the recognition they deserve because it is a big old job. Yeah. You know, you've got to cut the dogs. And, you know, the dogs sometimes, well, a lot of the time, especially when they're young, they don't sit still. So it's actually really great to, like, look and, and admire these pe- these amazing people's work. But now I'm in the park and I'm looking at dogs in the same way that I judge people's dancing after watching Strictly. <laughs> I'm sort of I'm sort of looking at the back end going I mean there's no shape there like they, they've not done a good job but it's lockdown right that everyone's haircuts are a little bit off I mean Simon <laughs> I know no one can see me because this is a podcast but I'm actually thankful that that's the case because I look awful right now my hair is in a hell of a state I, I'm growing it all out if you if only you could see the back Simon <laughs> it is an absolute atrocity so you know yeah I, I totally agree like it, it's an incredible it's an incredible feat I think groomers and especially Especially like with those lovely little beings, they bless them. They they don't they don't know what's going on half the time. So it's really you know it's it's a real big job grooming, it's, and I think it's amazing that show. It has made me incredibly dog broody though because I I watch that show and I just think when I'm on when I'm on Zoom calls and someone sort of holds up their baby, I'm like that that that's a baby. If someone holds <laughs> up their cat or their dog, I, I lose my mind. You, I bet you do, Simon. I wish I had my dog with me right now, but he's currently downstairs um, with my parents. It's my pa- my because when my parents come home, th- it's their time with him because they they insist on that because th- he's it like and people you know it's weird like is he my everyone's like is he do you class him as your son or your brother? <laughs> but I think I think there's like this shared sort of responsibility between my parents. So I think I'm I'm I come in the form of his father and his brother. Like sometimes you know we, he's like my brother when my parents are there, but when my parents are not there. I'm definitely his dad. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, so this is lockdown three. How, how mentally, how are you approaching this latest lockdown? I mean, are you digging out the sourdough starter again, or are you just sort of carrying on as normal? Well, I, you know what. I think I'm just carrying on as normal. I think there hasn't been a big shift it, really in terms of like what I've been doing. I've been home a lot of the time most of the time like really with the exception of a few things um to do with the show but other you know i i I, it's been kind of normal i i'm kind of getting big into um cooking this Mm. time more more so than the others like not not quite sourdough starter more like sort of curries and uh and pasta dishes i i I was a really bad student in the sense that, like, I just, you know, shove some chips and some chicken nuggets <laughs> in, the, in the oven. Whereas now, I, because I've graduated, I need to adult more. So, I, <laughs> so I'm trying to, like, look at loads of different things, like, you know, a bit of Nigella, a bit of microwave, all that kind of stuff. Oh, very, very nice. Oh, this this lockdown, there really hasn't been a thing, has there? there has, there's, not been a, there's not been a sourdough. There's not been a Tiger King. There hasn't been a Captain oh, yeah. Tom wafting around. No, there hasn't. Well, maybe it's down to me and you to start it, Simon. Why don't we brainstorm? I mean, <laughs> what could it be? I've already mentioned that in this light, it fe- I look a bit Captain Tomish. It sort of ages me <laughs> by about 50 years. So I could just start walking around in my garden. Maybe. Maybe we all start doing a Captain Tom. Maybe maybe that is the thing. And we all... Because, we, I mean, look, he's an incredible guy, right? What a, what a guy. So maybe we all need to channel a bit. I think we all kind of do need to channel a bit more C- Captain Tom, to be honest. I'm willing to channel Captain Tom in the sense of he launched a gin last year 
and I, I'd be quite happy to launch a gin. Oh, look, Simon, I wouldn't mind a bit of that. I, oh, the extra dollar <laughs> and a gin, and a gin <laughs> a cabinet that could, you can call your own. Bloody Nora, amazing. But sort of gin, gin aside, the lockdowns obviously have been tough, doubly tough on the arts industries. The t- TV industry has started to move again, but I guess the live arts industry haven't. Am I right in thinking that you had a play that you were going to work on just after It's a Sin before all this kicked off? Yeah, I was. So I was I was meant, you know, I'm, and also it's worth saying I'm such a theatre kid. You know, when I grew up, um, Amdram was what I relied on to basically find my love for, for acting. You know, especially in Wales, Amdram is is really big because, you know, I come from a working class area. Stage schools are difficult because often they they cost a, a bit of money. So Amdram is quite a cheap way to basically act, to, to go and do shows. And, you know, you do it for free. You pay your cons maybe twice a week, but it's two pounds mm. a week. You can't go wrong. It's it's pretty it's pretty incredible. So you know, theater is my is my way and but the means in which I'm most comfortable expressing myself. So when I got this job at the National, which is um which is a play called Romeo and Julie by an amazing writer called Gary Owen, oh you know what? I I, I sobbed for for two days straight because you know I grew up going to the National Theatre. It's a it's a it is like it is like the the hub for creativity probably globally like it's just what a, what a building that is and um I just couldn't be, I couldn't believe it I just couldn't believe it Simon so I you know when all this happened then obviously I was gutted but fingers crossed one day soon hopefully that it will go ahead and things we, well, we can all go to the theatre again I think yeah. everyone's dying to go to the theatre again it's so important it's such a huge thing that we rely on culturally you know, just the ability, just just even that it's there and we can go to one if we fancy it. I mean, obviously, there's so many more important things happening in the world at the moment. But losing losing these big cultural things, you know, those nights out, the things that you kind of really save up for, you really look forward to. Like, I miss the, I miss them so much, Callum. Oh, I, I bet you do, Simon. Me, me same, me same. I, I'm completely the same. I, I miss just going... You know, I, I remember, do you, do you remember on Britain's Got Talent really recently, all the musicals went on and did that one one show more, yeah, yeah. Um, one, one show more song. I I sobbed, Simon. I, I was crying my eyes out. It was incredible because you, you, you re, it's really that thing, isn't it? You don't know what you've got until it's gone. Yeah. And and because it's been gone for such a long time now, we're all dying for it to come back. Like I am, I can't. Like the moment I step back into a theater and I get fully immersed in a in a in a piece of theater that I'm loving and enjoying, it's going to be what a moment that's going to be. I just cannot wait. Can't, I can't wait. Was there ever a point when rehearsals for this play were going to carry on over Zoom? I'm sort of reimagining you now in stage screaming at whoever is the David to your Michael. <laughs> Oh, you know, they, they, I I wish I I wish there was a there was a time that it was going to happen over Zoom. But I think this this specific piece of theatre needs to be live and in and in and in the flesh because it's a it's a it's a play that's very like physical as well. It's all about it's a contemporary adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, mm. um, but very very different story as well. Um, it's, it's set in working class splot in Cardiff, and um, of Gary's written an, an incredible piece. Like he's 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 a writer that I've, him and Russell actually are both writers that I grew up reading and watching. So it was such a it was such a pleasure to 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 get it to get a role and uh, on a, you know obviously to play to play the lead. I was playing Romeo, Romeo Anthony <laughs> Jones. His name is. Feels like you're just ticking off the the great Welsh writers at the moment. Oh gosh, you know what? If I had that, if I had that luxury, Simon, <laughs> gosh, I, I mean, I would. But it 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 just so happened that those two pieces of theatre, those sorry, those two pieces of work were going on at a time where I was allowed to go up go up, go up for it. I'm sure if I wasn't around, some some other probably more talented Welsh actor would have got it and you know who, who can blame them because there's I tell you our Wales is full of incredible actors and it always will be I think the worry is though it almost sounds like you've got one rub left on the lamp you've sort of used your two wishes what's the other one what? just unemp- unemployment I think <laughs> <laughs> eternal unemployment one one wish left Callum that that would that, be fine what is this time it's this podcast and I'm on you <laughs> that's it I'm done I can retire <laughs> Thank <sighs> you.
one of the privileges in my job is that I get to watch shows before they're released. I got to see the whole of It's a Sin, which started on Channel 4 last Friday and is available on all four as a box set now, a few weeks before it aired. It's a staggering piece of work. It's so funny and fresh and heartbreaking and wonderfully filthy. There's death, but it also feels like a show that's so fundamentally about life and living. But we've we've had to wait for it, haven't we? Oh, gosh, absolutely. It's been a very long time. I mean, I think originally it was meant to come out some point last year, I think late, late in the year. Um, but, you know, obviously due to everything, like channels having to push back content and all that kind of stuff. So it's just in, got moved to January. And, you know, it's a big waiting thing because by the time now it is, the, around this time last year, we wrapped. So it's been a year, which is, a, which is quite a mad thing. You know, we've been sitting on this, this, this show for a year and you know it's it's a very it's a very special show to sit on you know because you know the stuff it covers and you know how important it might be to to many people well I hope anyway um you know so it's interesting it's interesting you say that because yeah it does feel like we've been sort of keeping this lid shut and now we're just so happy that we can sort of shout about it and and um people can watch it talk me through how you first got involved and I guess when well so I was at drama school I was at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama in Cardiff and I was doing a play called The Mert and the Venice and it's obviously a, a big Shakespeare play and uh at the time, I my agent sort of called me and they they said, um, look, because because the terms were when I was at school was that my agent wouldn't really put me up for anything unless it was a you know a, a big career uh, uh, opportunity that it would be something that would be really good for me. And I read, you know, they they said have a read of it and, and tell us what you think. And I read it overnight and I was just like, oh my gosh, alive! You know, even just mentioning Russell T Davis's name, I was name, I was like, well, if, you know what my answer is going to be for this? There's <laughs> nothing Russell does that is awful or even the, the remotely bad. So, gosh, I read it overnight and I just was. I just remember reading it so quickly. Mm. I remember just being able to read, and I, you know, it's worth saying I really struggle to read things. I just, I find it, I find it really hard to like sit down and like discipline myself into reading i have to like sort of i have my own strategy in, in terms of that but i sat on i read it just because it was a russell script and i had i you know i was able to read it and i was just like oh my gosh i need to be so i told my agent yes i will be i would love to be put up for it but because of the because of because i was doing the play i had to do a self-tape for it so i taped for it i taped something like sort of five or six scenes originally and then I got recalled and which was like, oh, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. I love it. Hopefully I'll meet Russell. I didn't. <laughs> I met the I met the other producers, the director um, and our casting director, Andy Pryor. Mm. And uh, the, I, I did the audition. I was in the room for about oh, 45 minutes, which is quite a long time, really, for an audition. And then I went home and the next day I was sort of by purely coincidence visiting my old comprehensive school. <laughs> I was at my my in my sixth form block with yeah. my teachers and, and um and I was with my old head of six and my phone starts vibrating in my pocket and it's my agent and I and I look and I go oh my gosh oh my gosh because you know agents don't call unless it's either really bad news or really good <laughs> yeah. news so so I was like oh my gosh I I need to take this and my and my head of six so just put me in her office I answered the phone and my agent was like are you sitting down Callum and I was like no but tell me anyway <laughs> and um. And he, and he said, you know, you're not going to believe it, but, but this is the offer. And I just, oh, Simon, I just couldn't believe my luck. I genuinely just couldn't believe it. It was just, it felt like, um, it felt like the culmination of, 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 of a lot of work I've put in over the years. And I'm not ashamed to say that I've worked very hard to, to, to be an actor and, and gosh, you know, I just to be in a, in a Russell T Davis work is just, it's just, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm still not over it. I'm still sort of processing it all, to be honest. To get that call when you were back at your old school as well, that must've been, that must've been quite incredible. It's romantic, isn't it? It feels like, it feels almost like romantic. It feels, it, that moment was just crazy. I just remember being, being like, oh my gosh, this is happening in my school. Crazy. And obviously my, my head of sixth form was there and I was like, I was trying to explain to her what this was. And <laughs> she, she was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And and she was like, what does this mean? And she just give each other a big hug back when we could give each other hugs. And 
then um, I just drove. I, I, I drive my car around the valleys because obviously like public transport is rife. <laughs> so I um, so I, I drove straight down to my house and screamed into my parents' faces about the road. <laughs> You should visit that school more often just to see what, what other offers you'll get. <laughs> just to see what other phone calls I get. That's a good that's a good point, actually. Maybe I'll just pop down there today, see, see, what, <laughs> see what they're working off for me. <laughs> Do you think there was one teacher, though, that just thought, this is, this is too much of a coincidence. The day he comes here and he gets the offer of his life... He's ma- he's making it up. Oh, they, yeah, they they think I'm a proper. St- they probably was like, oh, he's planned it all. He's a proper star. <laughs> or he's come here to rub it in. <laughs> Call me at no. exactly twelve. Yeah, exactly twelve. <laughs> I'll be in the staff room. <laughs> Could you imagine? Gosh, I, that would be mad, wouldn't it? But you know, it was purely a coincidence, and that is the the crazy chance of it all. Really, I think life does that sometimes, doesn't it? It just does that thing where like you you get these moments, and it's just crazy i honestly simon i didn't know what to do with myself it was like one of those things i just couldn't keep still i was sort of looking at people for answers and obviously they didn't know what was going on either (laughs) and it was just this weird sort of hour of my life where i was just like what is going on So we're going to keep this part of the conversation light on spoilers for anyone who madly hasn't started it yet. But how would you describe It's a Sin to these baffled people who have not started it yet? Well, so It's a Sin is a five part drama about five friends who all moved to London at the age of 18. Ash is 19. Um and they they basically they all moved to London for different reasons. My character Colin moves because he wants to work in a tailor shop called Culver and Hound on Savile Row. And essentially, then it's the, it's about the journey of how they meet each other and how they basically grow and mature and and basically discover themselves a lot in this decade where everything changed. I think I think you know it's it's it, it's amidst the backdrop of the AIDS crisis, which is really important. Um, the the four central male characters are gay men and yeah it's all about what what happens then and, and how age sort of creeps into their lives and i mean we've had storylines in soaps and dramas over the years but this is the first british tv drama to deal with aids and hiv properly mm. uh, what did you learn about this period that you weren't aware of beforehand Yes, I I didn't know a lot about it at all. I I'd seen not so long ago. I saw Angels in America at the National, which was um gosh, that was one of the most incredible, extraordinary pieces of theatre I think I'll I've seen and I'll probably ever see in my lifetime. Um, also the cast of that was exceptional. You know, Russell Tovey, Nathan Lane. Yeah. Um, what a cast, incredible. And then uh, I I'd also seen things like Pride, which is an amazing film. Oh, it's so about good, the, isn't it? Yeah. Oh gosh, what a film! And it's great, and it's all it's you know filmed in Wales and set in Wales, which is exciting. At the, at the sexy priest before he was the sexy priest. The sexy priest, exactly. The amazing Andrew Scott, like oh, and he's brilliant in that. Yeah, he's he so good. An, he plays a very complex character, doesn't he? His storyline is very sad because mm. it's all about going back and sort of going home and having to process all that stuff, which is which is such a it's such a beautiful story in Pride. I I loved it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, so yeah, not a lot of, not a lot of things that I'd seen though. I, I hadn't seen Queer as Folk actually, um, which, you know, it's not, it's, it, it, AIDS is only mentioned briefly in that, I know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's another big sort of piece of work that, um, it obviously comes from Russell's canon. Um, so yeah, I did know a lot about it. And also I wasn't taught about it in school, which is, you know, bad and awful that we're not taught about in in history and also probably in you know sex education classes but you know that's that's another thing uh but yeah so i had to really go back and look at what what was going on and throw myself in really and immerse myself in the in the period and that's really interesting like that you you weren't taught about that in school because there's there's no way in 10 years time kids are not being taught about covid19 Oh, in it though, exactly. Like, it, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I think you know because there's a difference, isn't there? There's a big difference in the sense that that COVID, COVID nineteen, feels like you know it's it's affecting everybody, doesn't it? But you know they they thought back then that AIDS only affected gay men. So you know that's that's the difference. That's the big difference, and and I think that that's the difference in how it was treated as well. Is that you know. The government just dealt with it oh, 
atrociously. Yeah. You know, you look back at those the things that went on, flipping heck, it's just it was chaotic. It was chaos. It was just awful. And yeah, you just got to look back in shame, really, at how this government this government dealt with it. It's an obvious question now. And the parallels between today and then are so mirrored. And obviously, this this was written and finished well, well before we were talking on video chat all the time. But do you, do you think mm. the reaction to watching this show will be different in January 2021? I, I definitely think so. I think because we know what it's like to live with the virus now. We know what it's like to live in amongst the pandemic. And, you know, there's a lot of things that go on, go on in the show without giving too much away that are, are scarily paralleled. You know, like there's, there's moments where a, a character has to go to a hospital to visit someone and they have to put on gloves and PPE and a mask and a gown. And it's it's frightening. It's absolutely frightening that like obviously we can we we have to connect with that now because it's all we've been sort of exposed to really over this crazy time. And you know, things like social distancing. You know, there's a there's a bit in the show where a character um is basically has AIDS and they say to, to another character like to don't come too close. And you know, and this these things that you know we didn't call they they weren't called social distancing, but this is what it was. It was, it was, it really, really was. One of my favorite ever quotes is history repeats itself. It has to because nobody listens. Russell is so good at tapping into that in almost scarily accurate ways that if we don't yield those lessons they will just repeat themselves yeah yeah it is he's he's fantastic at doing that he's he's it's it's, it's frightening isn't it what that what that man is able to do it seems like he does this more and more as well and it's frightening like you know with years and years like yeah. the time of years and years was just scary it was too scary i i, I have i still have shivers when i think about it now and even with it to sin, it seems great that it's been timed um, in ja- in January now because you know I, we have more of it. We have more of a knowledge of how to live with the virus. So I really hope that people do connect to this show. Um, you know, in all sorts of ways, like you know, because because the characters, I really hope people connect with as well because we we all. Like the cast, we loved each other's characters. And I, if just for that, I hope people love the characters too, because Russell has written a, a, a magnificent ensemble. Like, you know, because I'm not, and I'm not just talking about the five central characters, I'm talking about the cameos and the people who just pop in for, for, for five minutes. They are just amazing. They're all amazing actors and fantastic characters because Russell never wastes a moment. He, ne- he never does. Absolutely. The chemistry, as you say, between all the actors is incredible. I feel like the next question is essentially, how do you make friends? But that's another podcast entirely. Um, <laughs> but how, how, do you, how do you build that, that chemistry on screen? Did you, did you have nights out together? Well, we, we did. We did. We absolutely did. We, we sort of went out and partied and had loads of fun because we were in Manchester and it was back when we could do things. So, you know, it was Canal Street and, you know, all that kind of stuff and just being able to just throw, immerse ourselves in not just the the period that the drama set in but the now of it like being able to be in Manchester I'd never been to Manchester before so as in I'd been to Manchester but I'd never <laughs> spent long periods of time there yeah. you know so it, even just that like being able to have fun and, and go out but you know we were sensible as well we weren't going out every night but you know <laughs> we'd occasionally spoil ourselves you know because because also we weren't always together there was times where obviously our, our character storylines go off on little tangents. So we were, we were then spending time with different, a different group of actors, which was again, amazing thing because, you know, there, there are some incredible actors that pop up in this show. Um, and you know, yeah, so that, that, that was, that was really exciting in itself. And there are incredible actors, but you yourself as the sweet natured Colin are also wonderful. Colin seems like the polar opposite of the likes of Richie played by Ollie Alexander or Roscoe played by Amari Douglas. Why do you think Colin is drawn to these, these guys? Well, I- Thank you. Thank you, first time, for saying such lovely words. Um, I didn't, I want to tell your listeners that I didn't pay you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I think Colin is drawn to 
the other characters because he looks up to them, I think. I think Ross Gore in particular is someone who who Colin really looks up to because Ross Gore's come from a really difficult background. And, you know, uh, it, for Ross Gore, it's his family. And I think for Colin, it's where he's from. You know, and 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 I think them too. You know, it's not. I don't think it's just. I don't think it's purely a but a fluke that they they end up sharing a room together. I think those two characters share something deeper than just happening to share a room together. They, you know, Roscoe, you know, talks fondly of Colin a lot of the time in the show, and and as does does Colin. You know, there's that there's a lovely moment where. Um, Ross goes about to attend the wedding of his sister, and Carl and Colin says, "Oh, you know, you look, you look nice. You look really nice." And <laughs> and they, they, they're there for each other, I think. You know, yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah. So I think it, definitely Colin looks up to them, and also they just all bloody cool. They're all yeah. really cool. You know, Richie and his exuberancy and his <laughs> and his confidence and his means of expressing himself, and Jill, who's just so sweet natured and loving. They, you know, they they all have their different roles in the group, and I think uh, Co- Colin just loves it. He loves it. It's probably and it's probably something that he never had back home. Bless him. So I think for this group of friends, to, you know, that he meets, you know, in London, it's, it's I think it's a lovely thing. I do want to talk a bit about pressure though, because not only is this a Russell T Davis drama, who has obviously written some of the most beloved dramas of the last two decades, Queer as Folk, Cucumbers, uh, as you say, years and years, and the rebooted doctor who but it is such a big and important story to tell and one that that hasn't really been told certainly not in a tv drama and of course it's your first big break did you feel that pressure oh i i did i i felt it a lot and i still feel it now i you know it's 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 scary you know even having done the work like even the fact that it's out now and people are watching it it's 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 scary you know because it means that people are going on this journey that we all went on and you know you 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 have imposter syndrome you just think oh you know could you know could someone else have done it better and all that kind of stuff so you know i think that's natural i have that a lot in my life i i always question myself and all my all my antics um but you know i think we all do that because we're human but you know it is a pressure russell's canon of work and also the amazing actors that he he employs is you know is is something that you have to look up to as an actor and i think to, to when you get the opportunity to be in one of his shows you've got to You've got to take it and grab hold of it and just make the most of every every single opportunity and and really respond to the right thing. Russell writes things and he means it with every inch of his body. So so do you, I think, as an actor. I think, you know, I really wanted to just get into it and just um, immerse myself in the role. Definitely, definitely. And as you've mentioned, people are watching this at the moment. I want to finish up talking about It's a Sin. Well, actually, I don't. I could talk about it solidly for the next couple of months. But you're a busy man, so I will I will have to finish talking about it soon. But I, I do want to briefly talk about episode one. So this is a spoiler warning for anyone who hasn't seen that episode. I will put in the description when it's safe to come back. So I will do a brief pause to let you just slip away. And we're back. So in many ways, episode one introduces us to so many characters, but it does feel like it's yours and Neil Patrick Harris's story and that that bond you formed together. What was it like working with Neil on that episode? Oh, it was it was something else, Simon. I, I grew up watching clips of Neil, watching his work. You know, I, I used to stay up really late when the Tony Awards were on to stream it illegally in my bedroom. <laughs> and, you know, with him, he, obviously his amazing opening that year was just incredible. And, you know, it's, I just saw him as an icon and I still see him as an icon. So to be able to find myself being in a show with him was just something just out, out of, I couldn't, ima- I couldn't have imagined it in my wildest dreams. I mean that. So, you know, I, that first day on set was just amazing. But you know what? Neil is an uh, incredibly generous and kind and open man and actor. So there was not a moment that was ever difficult or, cha- you know, challenging to work with. He's just, an, he's, a, he's a delight in every way. Like, he's just amazing. And even just to sit there, and sometimes I'd be, I'd be, we'd be doing a take and, Obviously, like, you know, this is between us here and your listeners. You know, I <laughs> I genuinely like I genuinely have like an out of body experience being like, oh my gosh, like this is Neil Patrick Harris and I'm acting 
you know, to him and with him and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And you'd just be like, he's amazing. He's just amazing. And I, I generally, sometimes I, I'd be pulled out of it because he's just so gifted and talented. So episode one, there were two scenes that absolutely broke me. So thanks for that, Callum. But let's, <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll, talk, we'll talk about the first one to begin with. It's just you and Neil in a bar having a pint, but there's something so beautiful about that scene. It's so beautifully written. Talk me through what it was like to film that scene. That scene was just so fun because we we were in a bar. We were in a real bar, like a pub, and we were surrounded by extras. And, and it felt, you know, the environment. Peter, our director, is really good at creating the vibes and the environments that exist in the show, even for the actors. So it very much felt like we were there. And, it, it, you know, it's that for, for, for Colin in that moment, he's going through this whole, he, you know, he, he, he's questioning what what sort of henry's motives are at first but then you know he discovers that they just he just wants to care for him and look after him and make sure he's he's okay so to film that scene was just amazing because i didn't have to act almost because neil is so brilliant at making you feel like in awe i was just in awe of him the whole time genuinely like it was just when i'm sort of like looking at him and sort of giggling and laughing it's because they 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 coming out genuinely i'm not i'm not forcing it like it's it's it was so special like honestly um simon it was incredible and then in the course of this episode, like Neil's arc's incredible. From that bar scene, they become friends really quickly. And then there's that lovely restaurant scene where Colin learns how Henry fell in love. And then we come to that incredible, incredible hospital scene, which is just achingly heartbreaking. What was it like to film that scene? Because that's the point where Colin is faced with this new virus that at this point doesn't even have a name and the potential that he's going to lose his best friend. Yeah, it's it's a really frightening time for Colin, I think. Um he's he has you know, he, he almost has no idea what's going on. You know, he's he's going like, but you know, if it's cancer, like cancer's not contagious, so why am I in all this stuff? And, you know, he says that and you know he doesn't know he doesn't understand it it's 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 surreal almost like you know what what's going on with covid you know for anyone everyone everyone like you know who had relatives that had covid they're like but what like, what is this thing i didn't know it could kill and you know all these things can happen so you know for a lot of it is calling processing what's going on and then he's also losing probably the bestest friend he'll ever have and has ever had he you know i can't even begin to explain how how formative henry is for colin he he allows him to truly discover who he is and i think for colin that's a huge step in his life and in his growth and his maturity so Henry's a huge loss for him. And I think that that's sort of that's why then he goes back to Miss McKenzie's house and he's like, right, I'm going out. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna have a pint and I'm gonna fucking do I'm gonna do something, <laughs> you know? And and that's when, of course, it's sort of the, the the stars align and he meets Roscoe and the gang. And it's such a rug pull as well, because you don't expect Neil Patrick Harris in the first episode that to happen to him. And it really strikes home the indiscriminate nature of this this disease mm, absolutely yeah oh, that's the thing you know you, who 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 in a who in a right mind would kill off neil patrick harris in the first episode well russell t davis does. <laughs> and, and you know and who else could do it so brilliantly other than russell and that's the thing you know it, it's 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 mad isn't it it's actually it's actually crazy that 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 happens but you know that they, you're right simon it's indiscriminate it, it, it can it, it, it this virus can absolutely get anyone um and could get anyone so you know henry henry coltrane just happens to be another victim and it's awful it's so tragic but you know i think what russell has done brilliantly in that it forces us to remember these characters and in that remember the people that died and you've spoken how easy it was to play someone in awe because you were in awe when you met neil patrick harris was it as easy to tap into those emotions when you had to say goodbye to him in in this episode Oh, oh, definitely. There, there were so many takes actually where, um, you know, I started tearing up 
um, because it's 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 sad, you know. And and you know, there's not a there is not a shot or a take that Neil wastes. He delivers the same performance every time in the most special way like it is never lackluster every single take was incredible so just to be on the receiving end of that was just something that was extraordinary it was like I said it was an out-of-body experience it really was it was something really really special it's such an incredible show and I would recommend that everyone ekes this out don't waste it as a box set tune in on Fridays at 9 p.m. What can we expect from Colin in the rest of this series, though? Well, you can expect a, a, a cheeky trip to New York. That's that's something <laughs> that, that that's something exciting that happens, and there's a lot of there's some some things that some exciting and crazy things that happen there, um, including something with Mr. Hart. Um, and there's also he he comes back and he gets some news that is um not very good, and and that that then takes him on. A journey then that we again uh don't expect so yeah i hope i hope people sort of enjoy colin's journey and go on it with him back him all the way because he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a cool little chap and and i i promise you he he loves you too <laughs> <laughs> i love that Uh, Callum, uh, I have to finish up by finding out what TV shows that have been keeping you going at these last few months. What have you been watching? So I was lucky enough to discover two brilliant shows um, over over lockdown, one of them being Succession, um, which is now probably my all time favorite ever TV show that um, I've seen. I just think that is an, an, an impeccable piece of work. Like, oh, my goodness me. Like you know it's jesse armstrong isn't it the, yeah the, the, yeah you know every every bit of that show is incredible not just the writing but the performances like matthew can i just shout out to matthew mcfadden if he ever listens to this <laughs> I, I i look up to him in so many ways i think he is a man of of, of extreme craft and talent i think he's just amazing and such a great ambassador for british actors i think as well to go out to go off and do some incredible american work he's absolutely incredible and he's one of those british actors that you don't realize is british unless you've seen anything else that he's been in and then he comes over here uh, and does quiz where he played uh, the sort of coughing major as a yeah. very different character and he's done these period dramas as darcy he's just incredible Oh, he's just, he's so multifaceted, like, and he's also Keely Hawes' husband, who's, who's yes. in the show. So there's, you know, hopefully one day maybe I'll meet him because I'd, I'd love to to just basically just sort of just tell him how incredibly he is for, for 10 minutes straight. Because <laughs> I think he's, I genuinely think he's amazing. Um, and the whole show, like, you know, is so funny and so dark and so witty and so dramatic. It's, it's Shakespearean, that show, I think. It's, it's 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 a it's a proper modern classic i think succession do you have a favorite moment from it i think always i always think about the bore on the floor but i don't know if that's my favorite moment but it's it's one that i i wake up and in, in cold sweats thinking about <laughs> bore on the floor is good one of my one of my favorite scenes is when the fa- the, the 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 there's a ter- there's a there's a, an attack on the building mm. and uh, Tom is stuck in our room and he starts throwing <laughs> bottles at Greg. Like I'm just, I'm obsessed with Tom and Greg's relationship. It is so funny. Like you know, there's that amazing line where, um, where basically Greg starts to blackmail Tom, and and and, and there's that amazing moment where Matthew McFadden goes, "Are you blackmailing me, Greg?" <laughs> <laughs> and you just love it they, their relationship is hilarious what was the other show that you've also been watching oh the west wing which is a show <sighs> that obviously is, is is you know not not new at all um it was actually i think it was made before i was born i, I was born in 99 and it was it was in the 90s right um obviously yeah. with Alison Janney and martin sheen oh i am a huge fan of political dramas so the west wing for me now has become the dawn of that like i love it i absolutely love it like oh and every episode is just pure class the the walk and talks yeah iconic iconic i'm in my second rewatch of the west wing at the moment because i love it and we're obviously in a different world now with the, with the change of president but it, it felt like quite the antidote to 
the current political spectrum just to watch really, really capable people talk smartly and just be smart. It, I, I oh, absolutely adore the West Wing. You're so right. Yeah, gosh, you know what we'd what we'd all give for Martin Sheen to be <laughs> the leader of the country. Like he's 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 amazing. He does everything with such with such wisdom and and creativity like he's just amazing like i i love that show and it's a show that i i'll probably be the same as you simon i'll just keep re-watching to be honest it's a bit like friends in that sense you know what i mean you can just watch it again and again and again and it doesn't get old all-time favorite west wing moment i'm not sure if you remember this but alison jenny's character cj craig she's just had surgery i think on her teeth so she can't give the press conference uh, so josh lynham has to come in and do it instead and he's so cocky and he thinks it's such an easy job and the press just absolutely eat him alive when, whenever i felt a bit low in lockdown one i would just watch that clip it was incredible and, and they're so funny right like they're just hilarious like Alice and Johnny like she's always been hilarious obviously like we all know that but like it, even when she was like then like quite you know which I guess was quite early on in her career now when you think about all the stuff she's done since she's just amazing she's hilarious I, I love Josh as well like oh they're all just awesome I love it I need to I need to watch the um the HBO Max special they did which is the it was on stage right yeah it was like yeah the, in a, in a theatre I need to watch that next I think it's really really good Callum thank you so much for joining me today I've really loved having you I love that you've got a dog I love that you love the West Wing I've had, I've had a great time thank you Simon you are a legend and I really really appreciate you having me on thank you so much if I sounded a bit giddy at the end of that conversation it was because well I was a bit giddy I honestly had the best time doing this episode. I haven't recorded a podcast since June and just chatting to Callum for an hour was the nicest thing. I really, really loved it and I hope that comes across in this episode. We recorded this just before the first episode of It's a Sin was broadcast. So Callum was completely unaware at this point of the avalanche of love we now have for him and Colin. You always make our guests feel so special after each episode. So please... Do send Callum some love on socials. As I mentioned in the episode, It's a Sin is now available as a box set on all four. It is genuinely, and I do mean genuinely, one of the best TV shows I've ever watched. Please, please seek it out as soon as you are able, because you will not regret it. A huge thank you for returning to this podcast after the hiatus. It was nice to have taken a break, but I have missed this so much. This series, episodes will be dropping every fortnight as opposed to every week, just for a little bit more breathing space. So keep an eye out for the next one on Tuesday, February the 2nd. The easiest way to get your next episode first is, of course, to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And as always, five stars is always welcome if you're feeling particularly generous. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please stay indoors.